I don't, I don't believe in logic. You ever go to AC? Oh my God. I know some people that went to AC got wiped out. Now, but seriously, probability is there is no reason for optimism. There's only one thing that's going to be different about this year than last year. And it's going to be the way you choose to live your life and how I live my life. Turbulence will happen. New challenges will come. But how you handle them. And you know what? Just like me, when you're going through a tough time in your life, and it will happen, it's not if it will happen, it's when it will seem darker. How many people, when you struggle, it just seems like the whole world is falling apart? Everything seems bleak and dark, and you hate everybody. You get annoyed by little things. And it just seems so dark, you can't see the light in the end of the tunnel. And what you need, really, in that moment is not to be alone. You need an encourager. You need someone to come and smack you upside down and be like, the world is not ending. And you go, yeah, it feels like it. And the person goes, because I'm here for you. My son was an encourager. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit, we've been on the person of the Holy Spirit for a while, it's the counselor. Now, I don't know how many counselors you met, but the counselors are supposed to be encouraging. <laughs> If you pay all that money, they better be encouraging. And the Holy Spirit comes to encourage us in our times of distress. But the Holy Spirit is not someone that just does it by himself. That's why, that's why there is a community of faith. There's a church. And when people struggle, we need people to remind us. Yes, circumstantially, just like last year and the year before that, Turbulence will happen, storms will come, but God will get us through. Amen? You need that voice, that encouraging voice in your life. And let's look right now at Ephesians 4, and what Paul says, and I want to read this with you. And this is what Paul says. Do not let any what? Unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others, what? According to their needs. How many people, when they're in trouble... People don't encourage them and put them down. Why are you struggling? <laughs> you know? That's the stupidest question when someone's struggling. Why are you struggling with that? Get over it. That's <laughs> like, what? I'm struggling with it because I'm struggling with it. Get over it. And, and so Paul says, according to their needs, and, and it may benefit those who listen. How many people do that? They're like, not me. Well, that's why Paul is saying this. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. You see, the, the Spirit, the, Holy, the person of the Holy Spirit's main objective is to encourage believers in times of turbulence in their life. It's not if, when it happens, the Holy Spirit comes as what? Light, encouragement. And the Holy Spirit wants us to join him in that mission. And it says this. And do not, what? Uh, the, grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God, what? Forgave you. This year, 180's vision as we start off, I want to tell you why we want to release people, release a community of encouragers. I'm not just talking about one person when you're, when you're struggling. I'm talking about like 10 people coming around and be like, hey, wake up and, and hug you if you need it. If that's not your love language, well, I don't know. <laughs> Figure it out. But you know what I mean? Like a community of encouragers. Why? Because it will. Turbulence will happen. And today as we talk about the scripture, I want to tell you the vision that God has for our church and for 180 and what kind of people we want to be, what kind of community we want to be. Because people will struggle. We will struggle. And we need each other when this happens. Okay, so let's go to the passage. And I want to show you a model of how Jesus embodies this idea of, of encouragement. A lot of times when people struggle in our cutthroat culture in New York and in our own life, we want to fix people. No, we don't want to spend another minute with tears. We don't want to spend another minute, you know, and it gets annoying after a while if people struggle with the same thing. 
And you know, let me just tell you right now, people don't want to struggle with the same thing. How many people want to struggle with the same thing over and over again? You, you get up in the morning and you go, man, I want to struggle with that so bad. <laughs> I mean, no, one, no one does that. It's, it's like when people struggle, uh, a lot of times what people do when they stand is that the enemy, the evil one, loves this about God because people are their worst critic. And people don't want to be like that. And I think God understands our heart. And that's why, you know, the Bible says that God, what, doesn't judge by appearance, but he judges the heart of man. People don't want to struggle with it. They just do, and they can't help it. It's like liking someone. You don't know why you like them. You just do. You go, I wish I don't like them. You go, but I like them. You can't control that. So when struggles come, we need the perspective of Jesus. Jesus had this golden touch. We talked about on Christmas Jesus had this golden touch of making someone feel loved, yet at the same time life-changing and really pierce through the darkness in their life, but yet loving. I mean, he has this, he has this beautiful power and, and, you know, characteristic of making people feel a certain way and letting them be set free rather than condemned. And a lot of us, when people struggle, we are better at condemning them or making them feel condemned than setting them free or bringing any type, you know, of comfort. So look at Jesus' model when people struggle and doubt. And let's learn from it. And let's join the Holy Spirit and Jesus building a community of encouragers. Because I realized uh, as I prayed for the last couple of weeks that God put this in my heart that, that 180, though we're good with truth and we're good with living for Jesus, we need to come from the perspective when people struggle, we need to be more understanding about those struggles, and we have to become more like the Holy Spirit and not like our culture. And <laughs> we're like, yes, that would be nice. Now, let's go to our passage. Now watch. Now, Thomas was one of the 12 apostles chosen by Jesus. And let me just tell you why Thomas is important. Thomas, legend says, went to China. Now, I don't know about you, but there's no planes back then. Okay, it's pretty far from the Middle East to China. And he went there uh, and, and to preach the gospel, and that's why China opened up. And if you actually study the et etymology of the name Jesus in Chinese, you get a lamb and a cross. And the, it's impossible for them to know that, except if a missionary went there. And biblical scholars say that Thomas ended up in China and preached the gospel. So Thomas is pretty important. And he did something to change the world in his culture. And he traveled pretty far to tell about this man, Jesus, where in this passage we read, he doubted Jesus. How many people ever doubted Jesus? No, right? No. Not in our church. No one doubts Jesus. No one doubts God in 180. Everybody believes in God, that God's going to come through, God's going to keep his promises. You know, either you were once agnostic or atheistic or whatever stick, you know, you were there and, and you were, you were, of course you were struggling with it because first thing you need to learn from this passage is that true faith cannot come without doubt, right? You don't just believe in something just because someone said it. No, there must be a struggle, a crisis of doubt to really own true faith. And Thomas here struggles because what Jesus died, and I think it's pretty reasonable that when, someone's, when someone physically dies, you don't think they'll come back to life. And Thomas is like, nah. And all the disciples were like the other, you know, other ten, because we know Judas betrayed Jesus and he died. And the other ten said, we saw Jesus. And Thomas is like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when I tell people about what, about what God has done in my life, they look at me and go, yeah, okay, that's nice. It's like euphemism for you're crazy. <laughs> you know, you're crazy. And then that's that. And the Lord, had, and then, you know, it's like, I feel like, you know, the Lord worked in my life. You know, he changed my life. And people still look at me, I'm crazy. Because sometimes people need to what? Experience that reality for themselves. You can't impose it. You can't superficially create it. So Thomas here struggles that Jesus is alive. Oh, just like a lot of us. You know, we believe that Jesus is alive, and we haven't even seen Jesus. We just know by faith that he's there. You know, we can go into all the empirical history of it, but we just know that he's alive, but we struggle with it sometimes. And Thomas was just like that. He was struggling with it. 
And he said that, hey, I'm not going to believe in Jesus un unless the dead man, like if someone comes and he doesn't have the scars in his hands and feet, forget about it. It's someone else. It's a lookalike. You know, it's a copycat. So Thomas says, you know, well, you know what? I'm going to believe. I'm only believing if Jesus shows up and all, you know, Peter, the great apostle, and John is there saying, holding Thomas down, be like, Thomas, you know me. You know I wouldn't lie. Come on, man. I let you that $50 before, remember? <laughs> you know, like, they're bringing existential experience in their relationship. But for Thomas, he's like, no, 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 no. I won't believe unless I see Jesus and I feel him. And I think that this is a good picture of not really, it's, it's really about faith and skepticism, but it's really more about community. How community responds when crisis takes place in someone's life. And that is a lesson that we all need to learn because it always happens. It will happen and will continue to dominate the storyline of our life. People will struggle, not you, but someone else, your friend, with faith, with God. And it's not, if, it's not about the existence of God. And for some people, it is. You're agnostic. You're not sure. And that's your struggle. You're a seeker. But for some people, you're not sure if God could come through in this situation of your life. It will happen. And it gives us a good context of how to live community when crisis happens, right? What are you supposed to do? You know, Peter and, and John, I bet you they were pretty annoyed. Like some of us, right, when some of our friends struggle. Again? You're struggling with that again? Oh my gosh. You know, in, in, in the church sometimes, we want things to be functional. So functional and effective, we lose Jesus and the whole point of the gospel in it because we just want our preference, our convenience to be what? We want tranquility. We just want to have a good time. But let me just tell you, life is not about a good time. You know that? If you want a good time, go to happy hour. That's the only time you're going to be happy. Okay? Other parts of life, and that's why people go to happy hour, to escape the unhappy life. Why? Because happy is about a temporal, circumstantial event, meaning you're happy because. Listen, I'm not happy. I, I could be happy for a moment. I go to McDonald's, I'm happy. Five minutes later, I'm not happy because I'm hungry again. I could be sitting in the sofa... And I'm happy to watch a TV show, but I want to change the channel, but the remote controls and the other stuff, I'm unhappy. <laughs> See, happiness is about circumstances. So, and, and, and why you can't be happy is because circumstances cannot change. You can't control your circumstances, even though you could try. You can't change your circumstances. You can't change your environment. Come on, you should just accept that. You can't. So what do you do when people struggle? How should we respond? Well, you know, I was talking to, you know, I always have this open culture at 180. I mean, I want you to know from me that when people leave 180, people don't leave churches just because they're just messed up. Well, that's part of it. But people leave and people struggle and don't come to church and people don't show up to small group and people don't come and, and do all the things that a believer is called to do, not because they don't want to, but because of what? They're struggling. So people who leave 180, you know, I talk to them on Facebook. I stalk them. <laughs> you know, and because, I, because I'm a pastor, I'm just, you know, what, what am I doing? I'm just Shepherd Dane. But it's really stalking. <laughs> it's prophetic stalking. And, um, and, you know, I was recently talking to, you know, one person that, that left, and, and we were talking about, you know, their life. And I, I just said, Happy New Year, and Merry Christmas, or their birthday, you know, any type of excuse. Be like, hey, come on now. How, how's your life going? And, you know, and, and a lot of times they're surprised that I would talk to them because they felt like when they leave, they leave a family. But, but let me just tell you, when you're in a family, families, you, you can never cut that off. Once you're family, you're family. And so I'm talking to them, and, and they're like, so, you know, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing okay. Um, you know, I'm doing this and doing that, you know. Sometimes they tell me things I don't need to know. You know, I brushed my teeth today. Well, good. <laughs> but, uh, but the, you know, this person was like, well, I haven't gone to church for two years after I left, 180. I was like, how come? I don't know. It just, 
I just couldn't really, you know, find the right place. And I just thought, you know, my life and God just, you know, are, are so far away. And I'm like, well, why don't you come back? I can't. Why not? You're not going to church. Your life, you know, is it great? No, I, need, I know I need to. And, and we start talking. Like, and the person said, well, I, I just feel like if I go back, it's going to be awkward. You know? It's going to just... You know, people are going to see me, and I'm going to be, you know, the black sheep. You know, it, it's amazing that that culture is so unlike Jesus, right? When Jesus is always open to people returning, the prodigal son. I mean, how many times did I preach on that? Like 50 billion times. <laughs> you know, there was a time where I preached on that for a whole year. People were like, oh, Luke 15, again? <laughs> Obviously, we didn't get it. I mean, this person was like, well, I want to be awesome. You know, you, I said, do you remember the time Luke 15? Yeah, yeah, but, you know, that might work for other people. That won't work for me. And, and, and we kept talking about it. And I said, well, you know, you know, 300-something people came to Christ in the last three years, and you were gone two years ago. So most of the people here you don't know anymore. And the person said, true. So I tricked them now. You know? <laughs> well, we were talking, and, and, and I realized that when people are struggling, that's when they give up, right? When, when people hit crisis, and the temptations of life come, and when expectations come, even within the community of faith, what we need at that moment is not people to bring a knife and be like, okay, get out already. And be like, Let me just kill you. Let me end you. But what we need are encouragers. And, and remind people what the gospel really is. I mean, if you think about this in your own life, you're here today not because you never struggled in the last three years, right? It's not like you woke up and like, oh, I love 180. I love Jesus. You know? <laughs> I love everybody. No, you were struggling. You, were, you, you struggled, and you went through some hard times in your life, and I guarantee you the reason why you're here, the reason why you're following God, and the reason why you're fighting and breaking through in your life is because someone was Jesus to you. Someone encouraged you. In your time, in your darkest time in your life, wasn't it? I pray that the Spirit of God would show you the moment in your life in the last couple of years when people were there for you. And that's why you're here. Because if they weren't an encourager, the Holy Spirit, that community of encouragers, where would you be today? You'd be like everybody else that left out of discouragement or gave up faith out of discouragement. People, 2012, I want to pray and I want to ask you that we become a community of encouragers. Just people of, let's call it thumbs up people. <laughs> just, let's just walk around like this when people are struggling. I'm here for you. I am here for you. And you give them a smile. I'm here for you. Because, you know, if you look at this passage, Jesus doesn't. Say, Thomas, how could you? You should have gotten it by now. It's been three years. How many times do I have to preach? Dude, I, I died and resurrected from the dead. What is wrong with you? You know me. No, Jesus took a different approach with his doubt, his crisis, his struggle. Jesus, what? Understood it. People, I pray the Spirit of God will show you how Jesus was represented to you in your struggle. Let me tell you right now, I believe that this element of encouragement, if we got it down in 180, you would see 100% growth in 2012. You would see people return back to the Father that left, that are struggling right now. You will see lives changed. And people feel loved by God in ways you never felt before. And you will see life change over and over again in your life and other people's lives. And you'll see a movement of God's love. Amen? I pray right now the Spirit would show you, let you feel that. So let's go down. So how does Jesus do it? Right? So why do we want to release community, a community, a tons, tons of people, thumbs up people, that encourage people? Well, first, read it with me. What? All, without exception, will Struggle. Don't get annoyed by it. Just expect it. And become this person. Become this person. 
And that's what people ask me, Pastor, why do you always smile when I'm struggling? Because <laughs> I know what's coming. Hours and hours of prayer. <laughs> you, you go, why, why are you laugh at me when I'm struggling? It's, it's not funny. I'm like, well, I think it's funny. I think it's funny because this is part of life. This is part of faith. This is part of love. <laughs> this is what it means. And people are like, stop smiling, smirking at me. Like, you know my life. I do. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just, what, it's just, it is what it is. And, and, and you know, I, I, I see how Jesus is and how he deals with people. I, I, I pray that 180 would reflect that, you know. That would be the vision of our church, the vision of, of a community. So let's go down. And um, this is how Jesus modeled it. Right? So a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them this time. Through the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Verse 28. And this is the response when encouragement comes. Read it with me. Verse 28 out loud. Thomas said to him, Lord. Okay, read it, read it, I said read it out loud for human beings to hear. Okay? Thomas said to him, what? My Lord and what? My God. People, when you are there for people in their crisis, and you become Jesus for them, their doubt, their struggle, as they triumph over them, their faith becomes stronger than ever. Thomas said, for the first time, he knew Jesus was Savior. He knew Jesus was Messiah. But no, this is worship. My Lord and my God. I know sometimes we use that as bad words. <laughs> my Lord, my God, you're, you're annoying. <laughs> oh, my Lord, my God, stop struggling with this. No, this becomes from a negative to a positive, and Thomas worships. People, mission exists because worship doesn't. People struggle because they don't want to struggle. They just do, and you can't help it. They're human. They doubt. They struggle. Jesus meets them where they're at, encourages them. Jesus doesn't approach them in a way where it says, well, stop that. How could you? He goes, feel my skin. You, you notice Jesus says, don't touch my, he doesn't say touch my feet. That's a little too intimate. You know, but he says, touch my hand, touch my side. That's enough. Right. But Jesus says, touch it. But intimacy is really moving into me. Right. He says, feel my hands, feel my side. Jesus was very approachable. Jesus was there for him and met him where he was. And that changed his life. You know, some people in 180 has been with me for a long time. I knew them since they were like 16 years old. And now they're like 28 years old. <laughs> Almost 30 years old, you know? So in the course of more than a decade, you do a lot of life. And you know, a lot of times, um, I don't realize the power of community. I don't realize, I don't um, get hit by the power of what it means to just be present with someone in that community. Because you don't really think much of it when you do it. but the ramifications and the result are powerful. And I was just recently talking to Wish, you know, talking to Eddie. You don't know who he is. He's been with me for the last decade. And he is the most loyal person I have at one day. You know, if I need anything at any moment, any crisis, he will take a plane and get there. Why? And, and you know, Jesus with Thomas, and I want to draw this parallel, when you're there for people in the time of crisis, they will be there for you in your crisis or whatever you need. And that's why Thomas, my Lord, my God, went to China. He went the furthest of all the disciples and traveled. All the disciples probably died along the way. They got murdered. But Thomas made it all. He just, you know, he went out of his way for Jesus because why? That power of love, that power of community was so powerful and made him run on it. And you know what? You know, I remember when Eddie's dad 
passed away when he was 16. I was there. And one day, Mush online is telling me on, on Father's Day, he goes, yo, son, that's a secret between us, okay? He goes, I, I just want to thank you for being there for me. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, yeah, that's nice. You know, I'm always there for you. And he says the same things over and over again all the time. But he goes, he goes, and he, he reminds me of all a decade of things that I totally forgot about. He says, yo, I remember just before my dad passed away, you were at my house and you were crying for my dad to heal. He goes, I saw that. And I was, I was like, I was eight. I was like, let's not cry. You know? <laughs> and, and how do you remember something from 12, 12 years ago? The things you can't see people, you don't even remember. People feel, and they feel it deeply. And he was like, I, he, goes, he goes, thank you for, for praying for my dad. Yes, I know that he passed away and you were there at the funeral, but I saw you at, right at my house, on your knees, praying and crying and tearing. He goes, dad, you know, and he goes, he goes, thank you for that. And then he goes, he goes and you, you remember, you know, a couple years ago when you called me on Father's Day and said, how are you? Are you doing okay? Because, you know, I just logically thought, you know, well, it's Father's Day and he doesn't have a father, so I'll call. And he goes... I was crying that day. I was like, oh, this is this is a this is not a good in conversation. And and you know, I I really think about it through all the years of of going through this with people in our community, and I have so many other stories like this. People. When you're there for people in times of crisis, when you're there for times of need, you really could change the world for one person. And for me, one of the greatest privileges of being in this community for this long, and for some of you being part of our community, if you can really be an encouragement in times of crisis, I believe you know, collectively, we can be the hope of the world. We can really be and show people Jesus' hands and feet. And this is what Jesus says in the end, right? Jesus says what? In verse 29, Jesus says, Then Jesus told them, Because you have seen me, you have what? You believe. Blessed are those who have not seen me. And what? And yet have believed. People, Jesus died and rose again, and now he's in heaven. But now we're his hands and feet. We have to show people in their crisis, in their doubt, in their struggles, who Jesus is. That's our vision. And when you do that, you become the hope of the world. And that's our vision. So why do we want to release a community? Not just release people, a community, a thumbs up community of encouragers. Well, last lesson we learned from Jesus' model of being an encouragement is what? Love and encouragement are what? Inseparable. Love and encouragement are inseparable people. You can't have a church without encouragement. Because if the gospel is about good news, if the gospel is about telling people that God loves them, and then when they struggle, you tell them, we don't love you. When you love you, when you don't struggle, when you're victorious, that's a lie. We must love people deeply and the most when they struggle, when they are in crisis. And when you do, people remember, and that becomes a fuel for them to run on, and it changes the world. For someone like Thomas, and even for someone like Bush, that's part of our community. And I pray today that we become that community, and I pray that you would catch a vision for that. Amen? Let's stand and pray together. Father, we want to come before you this afternoon.
Father, we want to pray that um, we become a community of encouragers. Will you lift your hands with me to God? <coughs> People need the Lord, guys. People need the Lord when they go through crisis. When God seems far, we have to represent him to our family and our friends and to our world. And that's why the, that's what the church is called to be, the hope of the world. To be there for people when things seem uncertain. To be the certainty for them when crisis hits their life and turbulence hits their life. Father, I want to pray that Wanani become a community of encouragers. We become, we become the most encouraging community in the world. We become so encouraging, it will make people want to throw up. <laughs> we become thumbs, a prophetic thumbs up people. We become coaches, God. We'll become people that inspire others in spite of their circumstances to look up to God and to meet God's love and power. And for them, like Thomas, to run the race of faith until they finish Father, we pray for this fuel this year. Because, Lord, there will be nothing different about this year than last. The only thing different is if we encourage one another in crisis. And that will make all the difference. Father, we want to pray as we start the new year. Father, this year we pray, God, that we would be a community of encouragers to one another. That we would be Jesus to people in their time of crisis and darkness. And we will bring the light and remind people who Jesus is. People, when people are full of love, when people are loved, people gain strength to do incredible things. Because you know the Bible says God is love. And let me tell you, love is an invasion in this planet. And when love enters, it's contagious. It's an epidemic we want in our church. Father, I want to pray that that love would become real. As you said, Jesus, you said to Thomas, he goes, blessed are you. You've seen and believed. But blessed are those who do not see and believe. Lord, you show up as we encourage people in crisis now. And we pray, God, this year, we would become a community of encouragers. Will you tell the Lord right now, God, let me, God, let change me when people are struggling in my life. Let me be Jesus to them. Let me pray for them. Let me buy them a hot meal. Remind them that God is still in the throne. That God is still in control. God is still writing the story. And he will finish what he started. Father, we thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God a clap more for you. Be seated. All right, so we've got a couple announcements for you today. Again, Happy New Year. This year, well, maybe I should say Sad New Year, because you're going to be encouraged. Your thumbs up people now. You know, we know that nothing's going to be different from this year to next. It's just going to be if you're going to encourage others in their time of crisis, and they're going to encourage you. And that's going to make all the difference this year. It's going to make people feel the love of God. When people feel the love of God, what happens? They let other people feel the love of God. And when that happens, you get revival. And we want that. Amen? We want that. Um, so let's start this year by joining Bible group. Okay? Everybody has a smart, smartphone. Subscribe to it, and the Bible comes to you. Amazing. Because you usually never go to the Bible. So get the email, and then the Bible comes to you so you can't avoid it. Don't delete it. Subscribe, not by peer pressure, but subscribe and, and read that chapter and let God speak to you. Start the day like that, you know, uh, on commuting. 
so that God's word would live in you. So that's number one. Number two, let's continue to pray for God to really encourage those who are struggling. So this is really a project in 180, okay? I'm going to make Henry make thumbs up campaign. <laughs> and uh, he's going to draw Jesus like really happy like this. <laughs> with me next to him like this. And be like, join the campaign. And you know, this year, for people that are struggling, your friends that are struggling in faith right now, that are doubting, that are going through a hard time in their life, will you be Jesus to them? Bring them, you know, bring them to small group. And they go, I don't want to go to small group. Then you go, you go, that's okay. You'll come next week. <laughs> okay? Encourage the hell out of them. <clears throat> to the point they go, what is wrong with you? You know, they're like, Jesus is just like this all the time. And then, and then email them the Jesus thumbs up thing. Uh, but really, in small groups, let, let, let that become the, I'm just going to do this now. Uh, I'm going to pray that this becomes our culture in 2012, all right? That this is our culture. And, and really encourage people. Tell them that they're invited back. Tell them that we love them. And send them Jesus thumbs up, okay? And, and that's going to be good. So we're going to pray for small groups. Lastly, we want to thank you. Um, for all those who have contributed to 180 and, and funding it, if you need a tax letter, you need to uh, email Andrew Rowe at uh, Andrew Rowe at 180 TV. <laughs> really simple, Andrew Rowe at 180 And then you get a tax letter for your taxes for the coming year um, where you get your tax deducted. All right? Uh, and we thank you for giving to this mission of changing the world and, and letting people feel the love of God. And we thank you for those of you that are giving to that. And you can give always at 180church.tv, and we do collect offering uh, in the back at the info booth, okay? So let's pray to Jesus, the number one thumbs up person. And let's pray that that spirit will be released in our church in 2012. <laughs> Father, we want to pray. You see that? I'm raising my thumbs. Uh, everybody lift their thumbs to Jesus. Do it. Father, we pray, God, that the spirit of encouragement would come this year. We pray, Father, every person that we lost to the evil one, that, that are struggling in their life and their faith, Father, we pray that we would be, we would join the Holy Spirit in you to be the greatest encouragers. To let them know that God has not forgotten them, that God has a purpose for them, and that God loves them and we love them. And we pray, Father, that we would represent Jesus. We would become the hands and feet of Jesus. We would let other people feel the pain they feel. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. That's why his hands were crucified and his side was crucified. Because in life there will be pain. But the good news of the gospel is that in that pain someone loves them and identifies with them and is there to encourage them and be there for them. Father, we pray we would live out the gospel this year that way. Father, as we start this year, we pray as we read the word of God, as we put you first, as we give to but this mission of changing the world by the love of God, we pray, God, that you be with us. That small groups will be filled with people that need you, that will be encouraged by you. And we pray, Father, everybody will leave small groups with thumbs up. And make this the spirit of encouragement contagious and epidemic in our culture. And everyone will feel uplifted and changed by God's love. We thank you. Thumbs up to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon.